namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa Finally, the weather, is, the weather is a little merciful to us today. <laughs> um, did everybody get the handout? Okay. <clears throat> okay, we still have to complete the sutta that I started, I can't say last week, three weeks ago. <laughs> This is Sutta number 29. This is the Maha Saropama Sutta, the greater discourse on the simile of the heartwood. This sutta is concerned with the purpose in leading the spiritual life, especially the life of renunciation under the Buddha. And just to review what we covered, the Buddha is taking the case first of a, what's called a clansman, a young man who out of faith goes forth into the homeless life wishing to, considering that he is a victim of birth, aging and death, a victim of suffering, and he goes forth, becomes ordained as a monk, in order to make an end of suffering. Then when he goes forth, he gets showered with gain, honor and praise, renown. And because of that, he feels satisfied, His purpose is fulfilled, then he becomes proud of himself, disparages others, and then he becomes negligent and fails to fulfill the purpose for which he originally entered upon the spiritual life. If you remember, I depicted a certain sequence. I think I could fit it, in, fit it into this little corner here. And then the final result of all of this is that he lives in suffering. Okay, so this is the first case of somebody who becomes, who sort of goes astray on account of becoming attached to gain that is being offered gifts and then one delights in these gifts. Honor, being respected, venerated, esteemed by others and then renown or praise and fame, fame and praise. And the Buddha uses a simile to illustrate this. It's like a person who has gone into a forest, into a wood, seeking heartwood, the strong, pithy wood at the center of the tree in order to build some, maybe some article of furniture like a table or to use the wood to build a house. He needs solid timber. And then he takes the foliage, the twigs, the leaves of the tree, and goes away thinking to build his table or to build a house with the leaves and the twigs. He will not be able to build a house in that way. Okay, the second case we also took last uh, last time. The sutta proceeds step by step 
Here we have somebody who goes forth out of faith into homelessness with the same thought, wanting to make an end of suffering. Then he wins gain, honor, and renown, but he is not pleased with that. And his intention is not fulfilled. In other words, he doesn't become complacent on that account. And he does not praise himself and disparage others and so on, but he undertakes the purification of his conduct, his virtue. And when he succeeds in purifying his conduct, then he becomes pleased with that, and his intention is fulfilled, and then he becomes a victim of all of these unwholesome states. Then he starts praising himself, disparaging others, thinking, I am virtuous, of good character. These other monks are immoral, of bad character. He becomes intoxicated with that attainment of virtue. He grows negligent, falls into negligence. And being negligent, he lives in suffering. Then the Buddha says that this is like a man, again, who goes into the woods seeking heartwood. He comes to a big tree. And this time... The man, he'll pass by the the twigs and leaves, but he takes the bark off the tree, removes it, and goes home, thinking he could build his table or his house out of the bark of the tree. Okay, now we come to the, into new territory. This is paragraph four in the sutta. We have some clansman, some young man who goes forth out of faith from the home life into homelessness, considering I am a victim of birth, aging and death, of sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief and despair. I am a victim of suffering, a prey to suffering. Surely an ending of this whole mass of suffering can be known. This was really, this was like the great thought that inspired so many people during the time of the Buddha. Right across northern India, they were leaving the home life, going forth into many different religious sects, all of them seeking, in some way, the final liberation from suffering. Okay, now we follow this new monk. He goes forth. He receives gain, honor, and renown. He's not pleased with that gain, honor, and renown, and his intention is not fulfilled. He's diligent, so he purifies his conduct. He attains purification of virtue. Now he is pleased with that attainment of virtue. That is, he feels it's something good. He's not going to think it's a bad quality. <laughs> So he is happy that he is purifying his conduct. It gives him some satisfaction. But he does not become complacent over that. The text says his intention is not fulfilled. He realizes that though the purification of virtue, of conduct, is a good quality, it's not sufficient. And so he continues on with his practice, not disparaging others, not praising himself. And then he enters upon the practice of calming meditation, taking up some meditation object to calm the mind. And as he practices diligently, he achieves what is called samadhi. Samadhi is the state in which the mind becomes collected focused, concentrated on the object. So we translate it concentration. But it's not just an ordinary state of concentration, like when you're reading a book and you're so absorbed in the book that somebody might be calling you and you don't even hear your name being called. It's not just an ordinary worldly state of concentration like that. But this is a state of meditative concentration in which the mind becomes so blissfully absorbed in the object 
that it enters into a completely different dimension of consciousness. All the processes of thinking, consideration, thought formations are quieting down, becoming stilled. States of joy, rapture, serenity are arising until the thoughts subside, quiet down, stop, and the mind is just absorbed in this one-pointed bliss and equanimity, bliss peacefulness and equanimity. And so people who enter into that state sometimes think that this is a completely transcendental state, a state completely beyond the world. And then they might think that they have reached some level of holiness, of spiritual realization. And what can often underlie the state of samadhi a very subtle defilement, particularly there will be or can be a clinging to the pleasure, the bliss, and the peacefulness of that state. And then also a subtle conceit, the sense that I am superior to others because I am able to achieve that state. So my mind is really purified and exalted while these other people with their scattered minds and their distracted thoughts are just far below myself. And so when a person enters into that state, if he's not careful, then he might easily surrender to this craving and clinging and then to this conceit. And that is what happens to the monk who's described here. On account of this, he lauds himself, praises himself, and disparages others thus. He says, I am concentrated. My mind is unified. But these other monks are unconcentrated with their minds astray. This, very, this is a common theme that happens in monasteries in Asia, particularly <laughs> in meditation monasteries, when with beginning monks who start to get good experience in meditation. Often, once the mind starts to get into the samadhi, then if the monk is not careful, if he doesn't have, especially if he doesn't have a skillful teacher who realizes what's happening to him and could break the attachment to that state, the monk can become very proud, even um, could even become um, supercilious to others, towards others. Okay, so then this monk he becomes intoxicated with that attainment of samadhi, concentration. He grows negligent, falls into negligence. Negligence here, this is in Pali, it's Pamada. Fang Yi is Chinese. Fang Yi. Fang Yi. Fang Yi. He goes negligent, falls into negligence, and being negligent, he lives in suffering. Okay, so this is like a map. <laughs> Again, the simile. This continues step by step. This is like a man who needs heartwood to build his house, his furniture. He comes to the great tree possessing heartwood and without thinking to go to the heart of the tree, he cuts away the outer bark and beneath the outer bark there's another layer which we call the inner bark. And he takes that away, thinking this is the essence, the heartwood of the tree. And he thinks he's going to build his house or his furniture from the inner bark. And so the Buddha, so if a man with good sight was observing him, he would see what this man has done and he would realize whatever it was this good man had to make with heartwood his purpose 
will not be served. And so this monk is in the same situation. He is called one who has taken the inner bark of the holy life and stopped short with that. Okay, now we go one step further. Again, we have a clansman who goes forth into the homeless life thinking to make an end of suffering. He, as When he goes forth, he gets gain, honor, and renown. He isn't pleased with that. His intention is not fulfilled. Then he purifies his conduct, his moral discipline. He is pleased that he has purified his discipline, but his intention is not fulfilled. Then, being diligent, he attains samadhi, concentration. And when he attains samadhi, again he is pleased with that attainment. Because it's really a sign of progress in the practice and the development. And it's a very blissful, peaceful, quiet state. And a very powerful, pure state of mind. But now his intention, his purpose, is not fulfilled. And he does not give rise to conceit, to arrogance, and disparage others. He continues his practice, and now he achieves what is called here knowledge and vision. In Pali, this is jnana dasana. Now this expression jnana dasana is used in different senses. Often it's used as the equivalent of insight knowledge. You say vipassana jnana. Normally that is the way it is used. But the expression also occurs with a different meaning. And according to the commentary, that is the sense intended here. According to the commentary, what is intended here is the achievement of the higher spiritual knowledges which are purely mundane. These are called in Pali, Abhinya. Particularly, one called Diva Chakku, which means divine eye. The Abhinya of the higher knowledges. Could this be Shen? Shentong? Is it Shentong? Shentong? Shentong is. Yeah, these are like the higher knowledges. Include, I include the spiritual powers. And then amongst them is the divine eye. This is one of the these higher knowledges. The divine eye is a type of knowledge through which one can see things happening in far distant places and even in other realms of existence. And this type of spiritual power can arise out of samadhi, out of concentration. Kenyan tongue for Abhinya. For the Abhinya? The Divine Eye. Right, 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 of course, yeah, yeah. Kenyan tongue, yeah. Okay, and we have to remember now that according to the opening paragraph, the Buddha spoke this sutta with reference to Devadatta. Devadatta was the Buddha's cousin who had gone astray on account of the development of these supernormal powers. 
And because he developed these supernormal powers, he thought that he was enlightened, a very spiritually advanced person. And so he wanted to take over the Buddhist order to overthrow the Buddha and become the head of the Buddha Sangha. And so now, okay, so now this monk develops this knowledge and vision, and now his intention is fulfilled. Now he's satisfied. He thinks that this knowledge and vision, these supernormal powers, this is the goal, the final attainment of the holy life. And so then he becomes proud of himself, disparages others, and he becomes intoxicated with that knowledge and vision, becomes negligent, and then he falls, he lives in suffering. And this is what happened to the Buddha's cousin, Deva Datta. He become, became intoxicated with that knowledge and vision and he fell away from the religious life. And now the Buddha uses a simile. He says, suppose a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood, came to a great tree, standing possessed of heartwood. Now, this man is somewhat <laughs> more intelligent than the others. He rejects the twig, he rejects the bark, the outer bark, the inner bark, but he comes to the sapwood. The sapwood is when you just, when you get just below the bark, then there's the soft wood, the outermost layer of wood. And he cuts that sapwood away and takes it away thinking to build his house or furniture out of the sapwood. And so the man with good sight, seeing him, would say, would realize that whatever it was that this good man had to make with the heartwood, his purpose will not be served. It will just be a useless endeavor. Right? <laughs> he builds a nice bench with the soft, with the sapwood, invites his friends to sit on the bench, they sit on it the bench collapses. <laughs> he builds a house, then he puts the second story, puts some other items on the second story, and then the roof will start, or the, not the roof, what do you call it? The, the ceiling will start to sag because the wood is not strong enough to hold the furniture on the second floor. Okay, now we continue. We'll come to the end now. So now we have some clansmen who goes forth out of faith. You see that the suttas are rep repetitive, but you have to read carefully in order to find out where the text differs from the previous from the previous paragraph. So this clansman goes forth with the same intention. He, gain, he acquires gain, honor, and renown. He is not pleased with it. His intention is not fulfilled. He purifies his conduct. He is pleased with that. His intention is not fulfilled. He achieves concentration. He is pleased with that, but his intention is not fulfilled. He achieves knowledge and vision. He could achieve these spiritual powers. He is pleased with that knowledge and vision, but he is, his intention is not fulfilled, and so on. He remains diligent, and being diligent, he attains what is here called perpetual liberation, or we could say permanent liberation. And the Buddha then says, it is impossible for that monk to fall away from that perpetual deliverance or liberation. Here the text uses an expression. 
Yeah, you know, vimoka means liberation or deliverance. Now the word samaya means time or occasion. And then the a uh, is a negation. So there's something called samaya vimoka. Samaya vimoka will be temporary liberation. And temporary liberation is just the liberation that's experienced in samadhi. In samadhi, the defilements are temporarily suppressed. The mind becomes very pure, clear, and bright. And one feels almost as one actually can feel as though one is liberated. It's a kind of temporary liberation. But the roots of the defilements are still intact. They're still present, not yet removed. But now, through diligent practice, this monk will go on. What the text doesn't mention is that he will have to develop panya, wisdom, prajna, in order to eliminate, eradicate the roots of the defilement. And through the development of that wisdom, then he cuts off all of the defilement and he attains that perpetual, that indestructible liberation. And the Buddha underscores this, emphasizes it, by saying it is impossible for that monk to fall away from that perpetual liberation. And then again, the Buddha illustrates this with the simile. This is the case of a man needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood. He comes to a great tree standing possessed of heartwood and cutting off only its heartwood. That is, he doesn't go for the twigs and leaves. He doesn't go for the... Well, of course, he has to remove the bark, but he just discards the bark. He cuts away the soft wood and he removes the core, the heart wood, and he takes that away knowing that this is heart wood. Then a man with good sight seeing him would say that this good person knows what is heartwood, knows what is sapwood, knows the inner bark, the outer bark, the twigs and the leaves. Thus, while needing heartwood, seeking heartwood, wandering in search of heartwood and so on, he took the heartwood away, knowing it was heartwood. And whatever it was this good man had to make with heartwood, his purpose will be served. And so too, then the Buddha repeats that passage. Then he comes to the conclusion of the sutta. And this sort of underscores the point, the reason why I included this sutta in this particular place. Because this, the suttas that we're taking here deal with the purpose of, the ultimate purpose of the spiritual life, according to the Buddha. So this holy life does not have gain, honor, and renown for its benefit. Or the attainment of virtue, that's good discipline, good conduct for its benefit. Or the attainment of samadhi, concentration for its benefit. Or knowledge and vision, whether it be insight knowledge or spiritual powers for its benefit. But it is this unshakable deliverance of mind. This is the unshakable liberation of mind. That is the goal of this holy life. That is its heartwood and its end.
Yeah, I like the, the Pali word, akupa cheto vibhuti. This must be udong shin cheto. Would that be correct? Udong, not movable, unmoving. Udong she she to. Udong, udong, not udong. Udong. <laughs> yeah, the word, the root, coop. No, shin, mind, chita. Yeah, chaito, chita, the same. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, want to, you can write the character. <laughs> yeah. That, that expression? Unmoving. This expression, unshakable liberation of mind. <laughs> I, I didn't give the English. I just went into the chat. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> okay, so this is the liberation of mind, the permanent liberation of mind, so that it can never be shaken, the mind can never be shaken anymore by any defilements or by any sensory impression. So it's the ultimate freedom of the mind. This would be the liberation of mind from greed, hatred, delusion, liberation from the from the cankers or asavas. Okay, that takes us to the end of this sutta. If there's any questions, comments, please. Any questions? Yeah. 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 Right, right. He attained permanent, he attained the temporary liberation while he was alive. But he couldn't maintain that liberate that liberation. It was like a samadhi that he attained. But each time because he had some illness apparently. So that illness would encroach the pain of the illness would encroach upon the mind. And so he would fall away from that concentration. And so that sort of put him in a state of despair. And so then he decided that it was pointless to go on living and he decided to take his own life this was Godika was his name and so when he was yeah he actually he sort of slit his throat (laughs) but in that process of dying apparently what happened because his faculties were very mature so he would have developed insight, wisdom before death took place and he would have achieved our hardship before death and so when the actual death took place he was an arhat and so the consciousness was not established anywhere so that was like that, by the time he died he had achieved the permanent liberation and so then Mara was searching for his consciousness and he went everywhere but he couldn't find it. <laughs> and the Buddha came with the monks to the place where he died and there was just this cloud of smoke swirling, swirling, swirling. But um, the Buddha said, do you see, monks, that cloud of smoke swirling around? That is Mara, the evil one. He is searching for the consciousness of the monk Godika. 
but the monk, but he will not find that consciousness. For the monk Gotika died with consciousness not established anywhere. A patistika vinyana. Sukhi. Yeah, yeah. 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 Dhamma chakra. Yeah. 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 Actually, when I read the sutta, I was thinking that the commentarial interpretation is either too narrow or even wrong. But then I came across again the first paragraph, which says that it's the Buddha was speaking with reference to Deva Datta. And that made me think that maybe the commentary is right. And I think that there are some suttas which do use the expression jnana, knowledge and vision, in reference to this divine eye. But one can take it in the other sense. One could say that, okay, jnana, dasana, we could take to be insight, knowledge. Okay, somebody develops the lower stages of insight knowledge and then because of that they become proud of it and think, okay, I've gotten these spectacular insight knowledges. I can see phenomena arising and passing away millions of times in a second. (laughs) Whereas these other meditators, they're only seeing things arising and passing away hundreds of times in a second. (laughs) And so then somebody can just become satisfied with, you know, become satisfied with the lower level of insight knowledge, become proud and attached to that, and then that will become an obstacle to further progress. So one can take the knowledge and vision in that sense. Any further questions? Yes. Um, yeah. This gets into rather technical territory. Let us say the Akupa Cheto Vimuti, that is the liberation of one who has attained Nirvana. Yeah, it's not a non return This is Arhatship. That is the state of mind of one who has reached Arhatship. Okay, then let us go on to the next sutta. <laughs> this is sutta number 27. This is a very important sutta. In fact, one of the most important because it gives what I call the main model or paradigm of the gradual path, complete path to liberation according to the, the, middle, the scheme of the middle length discourses. And this sutta also has special importance in the history of Buddhism in Sri Lanka because when Buddhism first came to Sri Lanka in the 3rd century BC, it was brought there by a monk called Mahinda who was the son of the king Ashoka. And when the Monk Mahinda, he was in Arhant, he came together with a group of monks. And when they first arrived at the royal capital, the king and the people, they were wondering, who are these strange people who have arrived in our island? They had never seen Buddhist monks before with shaved heads, with saffron robes, walking in very strange way. And they thought, are these human beings or beings from another planet? (laughs) And so, when finally they learned that these were disciples of the teacher, a religious teacher in India, then in order to explain to the king and the people what their mode of life was, the monk Mahinda taught them this shorter discourse on the simile of the elephant's footprint. Okay, in the sutta, it opens with a very, a very nice dramatic scene. It might be taken from you know, 
gives us a sort of nice picture of the day-to-day life in India at that period. It's like well, an upper level life. Here this takes place when the Buddha is living in Jaita's Grove near the town of Savati. This is the park given by his supporter Anatta Pindika. And at that time there was a Brahmin whose name was Janu Soni. This Brahmin Janu Soni, he was the advisor, the spiritual advisor to King Pasenadi. He was called the Purohita, that's like the chaplain or religious minister of the king. And he was very wealthy and a very highly esteemed Brahmin. And so he had this, <laughs> sort of maybe a, a way of showing off his high status, he had this all-white chariot drawn by white horses, white mares, And it's midday and he is driving out of Savati in his chariot with the white mares. And he sees a wanderer whom he must know on some previous occasion named Pilotika coming in the opposite direction and they meet and he asks him. He refers to him by his clan name, Vachayana. Apparently that's a Brahmin name. Where are you coming from in the middle of the day? And he says, I am coming from the presence of the Samana Gotama, the ascetic Gotama. And Janusoni must have heard reports already of the Buddha. In fact, he must have seated by the even visited the Buddha. But he just wants to get the opinion of this wonder of Pilotika, what he thinks of the Buddha. Of course, maybe he doesn't trust his own judgment and he thinks the other wanderers, they must be able to evaluate another person's wisdom more accurately than himself. So he says, what do you think of this ascetic Gautama's wisdom? Do you consider him a wise man? And Pilotika says, <laughs> Who am I to be able to judge the ascetic Gautama's lucidity of wisdom? One would surely have to be his equal to know the ascetic Gautama's lucidity of wisdom. Then Janusoni says, You are certainly praising the ascetic Gautama with high praise indeed. And then Pilotika says, Who am I to praise the ascetic Gotama? The ascetic Gotama is praised by those who are praised as best among gods and humans. So apparently this wonder of Pelotika must have met the Buddha, had discussions with him and been extremely impressed by his wisdom, by his demeanor, as well as by all of the reports he had heard from him. Okay, so now the Brahmin Janusoni asks Pilotika, what, is the, what, what are your reasons for having such firm confidence in the ascetic Gotama? And now Pilotika, the wonder of Pilotika, gives a simile. He says, suppose a wise elephant woodsman were to enter an elephant wood and were to see in the elephant wood a big elephant's footprint, long in extent and broad across. He would come to the conclusion, indeed, this is a big bull elephant. Do any of you have experience seeing elephants' footprints in the ground? (laughs) 
I once entered an elephant wood. <laughs> and I was very afraid. <laughs> and sometimes you do see the elephants, you see them in the distance. Yeah, 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 yeah. You see them. Yeah. Very big. <laughs> And when you see a big footprint, of the, not only the footprints, but you see other traces of elephants <laughs> that they leave on the ground. <laughs> okay, so now he says, okay, he's now applying the simile that he saw four footprints. Like when you see one footprint of the elephant, it's not enough. But when you see four footprints of the elephant, then you can come to the conclusion that there's really an elephant there. And so now he says, I saw four footprints of the ascetic, of the recluse Gotama. And so I came to to the conclusion that he is the blessed one, that he's fully enlightened, that his teaching, the Dhamma, is well proclaimed, and that the Sangha, his order, is practicing the good way. These are like stuck formulas for praising the Buddha, the Dhamma, the Sangha. Okay, now what are these four elephant footprints? Now you see in India in this time, all of the different religious teachers and religious seekers, they formed into different companies and they would travel around, meet each other, and they would engage in debate. And when a religious teacher would come to a town, to a village, then those who were very knowledgeable about the teachings of others, they would all come to listen to his teaching, sometimes not just to learn what he has to say, but they would like to debate with him. And so when they hear that he's coming, then they would try to ask trick questions or trap questions in order to catch him in a dilemma, to push him into a dilemma and embarrass him in in public. Okay, so now there were certain learned nobles, these are aristocrats, who were clever, very learned, knowledgeable about the doctrines of others, as sharp as hair-splitting marksmen. Hair-splitting marksmen, they go shooting animals, or they go shooting targets, that they could hit any kind of target with their arrow. And so these go about demolishing the views of others with their, the text actually here it translated with their sharp wits, but the Pali is panya, with their prajna. But this is not the real higher wisdom, but this is clever intelligence. And so some of them, they would hear that the recluse Gotama will come to to visit this village or this town, a village or town near the place where they are living. And so they think, ah, now this famous religious teacher is coming. We've already destroyed the doctrines of so many other teachers. This one will be an easy one to knock over. We'll go to him. They've maybe heard some reports about his teaching. So we'll formulate a question like this. Then they sort of map out their strategy. It's a little bit like playing chess. You know, you have to figure out, you. I'll move here, then my opponent will move there, then I'll move here, he'll move there, then I get him checkmate. Okay, so they think, if he's asked like this, he'll answer like this, and then we'll refute his doctrine in this way. But if he is asked like that, then he'll answer in that way, and so we'll refute his doctrine in that way. So either way, they'll get him. They'll get him, they'll trap him. And then dispute his doctrine. He's embarrassed in public. His following falls away. (laughs) And they go home proud, happy, 
They've knocked down another religious teacher. And so then they go, they hear that the Buddha has come to such and such a village or town. They go to listen to him. And so the Buddha is teaching, giving a discourse. And as the Buddha is speaking, they have the question in mind. But the Buddha is speaking, 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 and they're getting interested. And the Buddha is maybe using similes, analogies, giving very inspiring talks, maybe including some very elevating verses. And before long, they're not even interested in their questions anymore, but they really become absorbed in his discourse. They're listening, listening, listening. And at the end of the discourse, what do they do? They come up to the Buddha and they say, Venerable Sir, <laughs> we want to become your, your disciples. And so they give up their previous allegiance to the other teachings they might have been following and then they become followers of the Buddha. They become lay disciples of the Buddha, most of them. Okay, so that is the first footprint of the recluse Gautama. Then, the second footprint is that there are some, the first footprint are these learned, these are the nobles, the kshatriyas, the princes or aristocrats. The second footprint are the learned Brahmins. These are the ones who are learned in the Vedas, the scriptures, but they hold to the orthodoxy that the Vedas are the revealed truth, the divine truth. And so when they hear that the Buddha doesn't accept the authority of the Vedas, they think that he is a heretic, a nihilist, an atheist. And so they go to him in order to refute him. But again, when they hear that the Buddha speaks about morality, virtue, the higher life, the brahmacharya, the spiritual life, then they start listening. And then the Buddha will speak to them about even teaching them the way to realize Brahma through the practice of the Brahma Viharas, the meditations on universal love, compassion, altruistic joy, equanimity. So the Brahmins start listening and become interested, interested, and they become his disciples. And then there are the learned householders. They hear that the Buddha is teaching this religious life, that calling people to go forth into the homeless life, to give up the household life. And he sees, they see many of their young men, young women going forth, becoming monks and nuns. And maybe they go to him in order to argue with him say, how can you teach such a destructive doctrine if everybody becomes monks, everybody becomes nuns? What's going to happen to the human race? No more <laughs> no more humanity. The world will be empty. And so they go to hear the Buddha and then the Buddha gives them a discourse about how to lead the righteous household life, the five precepts, the ten ways of wholesome action how the parents should bring up the children, how children should look after the parents. And so they get impressed. They give up their arguments and they become his disciples. And then there are the learned ascetics, the recluses. They think that they have the path to enlightenment and that the Buddha is teaching a false path. Some of them think that they are arhats, or liberated ones. And so when they go to hear the Buddha teach, then the Buddha gives them a discourse about the higher religious life, the life of renunciation, of contemplation, of meditation, of wisdom, of liberation. And when they hear this discourse, then they also become disciples of the Buddha 
and then they become monastic disciples. They go forth under the Buddha and then before long they practice according to the Buddha's instructions and then before long they achieve the final goal of the holy life. And they become... And then after that they say... Now I'm reading from the text, paragraph 7. After they achieve this final goal for themselves, they say, we were very nearly lost. We very nearly perished. Formerly, we claim that we were recluses, we were summoners, ascetics. But we were not really ascetics. We claim that we were Brahmins. Brahmins in the sense of being spiritual, holy men, holy men. But we were not really holy men. We claim that we were Arahants, but we were not really Arahants. They were living in delusion about their attainment. But now, they say, now we are recluses. Now we are Brahmins. Now we are Arahants. When I saw this fourth footprint of the recluse Gotama, I came to the conclusion that the Blessed One is fully enlightened. And so then he concludes, he says, when I saw these four footprints of the recluse Gotama, I came to the conclusion the Blessed One is fully enlightened, the Dhamma is well proclaimed by the Blessed One, the Sangha is practicing the good way. Okay, that is the, all, that's all the explanation of that wonder of Pilotika, explaining why he has this confidence in the Buddha. And now when this was said, then the Brahman Janusoni, now he, he himself has been sort of won over by this report. And so as a mark of humility and a sign of his own growing trust and devotion to the Buddha, he gets out from his all-white chariot, <laughs> drawn by white mares. He rearranges his robe. This is a special sign of respect. So he puts it all up on one shoulder. And then he holds out his hands and the Anjali, the joined hands. Hujang, I think. Hujang, yeah. And um, so he holds out his hands in reverential salutation towards, I guess, towards the Jaita's grove. And he says, three times, he says, Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Honor to the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened. Honor to the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened. Honor to the Blessed One, accomplished and fully enlightened. Perhaps Sometime or other, we, we means I, is the polite way of saying, I might meet Master Gotama and have some conversation with him. Okay, that is sort of, we call this the dramatic prelude to the sutta. But now we come to the call it the essence of the sutta, the actual text of the sutta, that I will leave for next time. Hoping that we won't get any snow. <laughs> okay, any questions on this? So there's nothing really problematic in it. Yeah. Yeah, this is a convention in it's even used in English, not so much nowadays, but in earlier centuries. It's a, way of, a polite way of speaking. Um, there's an expression for it, we call it the editorial we. <laughs> in Chinese too, you have that. So why are you asking when... <laughs> <laughs> in Taiwanese 
Probably in mainland also. Woman, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I don't know, maybe it's just a, it's a natural instinct sort of not to focus too much attention on the I, the individual. Like even, yeah, they also call it the, in Eng- England they call it the royal, <laughs> it's called the royal I. The royal eye, like the king or queen makes the decree. We declare that <laughs> everybody must do such and such on such and such a day. But who is this we? It's only the king or the queen. <laughs> okay, so we will stop. Now. And please, next time, there were handouts today of material that I'll discuss next week. Oh, we do the sharing of the mirrors. Akasa ta jabuma ta deva naga mahidika punyantang anumodi pa chirang rakantu sasanan. Akasa ta jabuma ta deva naga mahidika punyantang anumodi pa chirang rakantu desanan. Akasa ta jabuma ta deva naga mahidika punyantam anumodipa chirang rakantu mantaram etavata cha amehi sampadam punya sampadam sabe deva anumodantu sabha sampati siddhya Eta vata cha am hei sampadam punya sampadam sabe bhuta anumodantu sabha sampati sedhya eva 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 sampati sedhya